Good evening. I am Angelique David, Chair of the Chicago State Foundation Board of Directors, and it is my sincere pleasure to welcome you to 63 Cents on the Dollar, Advancing Racial Equity in the Finance Profession. As Executive Managing Director, General Counsel, and Chief Operating Officer for an investment firm, I am acutely aware of the disparities in access and opportunity that exasperate the racial wealth gap in America. For generations, racial discrimination has limited opportunities for Black and Latinx Americans to earn and accumulate wealth. The widening gap is a horrible burden for our community and an albatross for the economy as a whole. While the finance industry is uniquely positioned to address policies and practices that fuel the racial wealth gap, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that the industry itself is still predominantly white and predominantly male. Diversifying finance from corporate boards and C-suite level leadership to personal advisors and consultants could dramatically improve products and services for Black and Latinx consumers, help narrow the racial wealth gap, and improve the economy overall. The leaders we've convened this evening are working to do just that. And I am thrilled about this panel and thank you for joining us this evening for this important conversation. Chicago State Foundation holds events like this free of charge for the benefit of the community. If you find value in this programming, I encourage you to visit www.csu.edu slash donate. Let me repeat that, www.csu.edu slash donate. Chicago State University is preparing future leaders for success in finance, arts, physics, engineering, law, and many more fields of study. Your financial supports make a tremendous difference in the lives of our student scholars. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to bring to the virtual stage tonight's moderator, Melissa Donaldson. Melissa is a Senior Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer at Wintrust Financial, where she supports the CEO and partners with leadership to establish diversity and inclusion strategies for business success. As a distinguished business civics leader, Melissa serves on a variety of boards, including the Financial Services Pipeline Steering Committee, Skills for Chicagoland's Future, and UCAN Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Council. She has been published in Diversity Executive and Workforce Management Magazine and is an adjunct lecturer in the New York, in the, I'm sorry, in the Northwestern University Master of Science in Communications program. Prior to joining Wintrust Financial, Melissa served as Director of Diversity and Networks and Communication for Walgreens and Director of Inclusion Practices at CDW. She is a superstar in this space and we are so happy to have her moderate tonight's discussion. Please join me in welcoming Melissa Donaldson. Thank you. Thank you, Angelique. It's such a pleasure for me to join the group this evening. And I want to thank you and the rest of the Chicago State Foundation Board and Darius Hillman for inviting me to be a part of the program this evening. We are in for a treat. I am so thrilled to be moderating a discussion with four absolutely phenomenal and dynamic women who are definitely making their mark in the financial services industry. I have to say an industry that even I have not seen a lot of individuals who look like me uh, selling, excelling the way that many of these women are and certainly the way that Chair David just described as well. So I'd like to bring each of these panelists in and then we have some questions that we're gonna sort of chat through. This is a conversation. Um, so we may dovetail in and out of many different things, but. We all agree that advancing financial equity in general and advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion in the industry is of critical importance during these times and for always. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Parika Sampson. Parika is the Senior Regional Diversity Officer for Morgan Stanley Wealth Management's Pacific Coast Region. Her responsibilities include driving diversity and inclusion, executing talent acquisition strategies, facilitating community engagement, and supporting business development initiatives across the region. Previously, she was the Regional Diversity Officer 
for Morgan Stanley in the Great Lakes region. And she also founded and managed Dearborn Consulting Partners, where she consulted on diversity and inclusion strategy and initiatives for Fortune 500 companies. Harika is an alumna of the University of California, Los Angeles, and she currently serves on the Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti's Private Sector Task Force on Race and Equity. I also have to say Parika has been a personal friend to me as we both served on the Financial Services Pipeline Steering Committee many years ago before California called her back home. So welcome Parika. Our next panelist is Nicole Sams. Nicole is a senior vice president and sub complex manager in Morgan Stanley's South Coast Complex. Personable and conscientious, her main responsibilities include helping existing financial advisors maximize the firm's global capabilities for the benefit of their clients, which are ultra high net worth individuals. We definitely want to hear more about that. Their families and their foundations, both in the U.S. and abroad. Prior to her current role, Nicole was the branch manager in the Beverly Hills Complex and a financial advisor associate. Nicole currently sits on the boards of three nonprofit organizations, the Williams Institute, Girls Inc., and the Santa Monica Boys and Girls Club. Welcome, Nicole. Our next dynamic panelist is Kristen Finney Cook. Kristen is a senior consultant at NEPC who helped to spearhead the NEPC Chicago office in 2010. She focuses on providing investment advice to large asset pools on investment policy development, asset allocation, investment manager selection, and performance monitoring. Kristen is also the co-chair of the Diverse Manager Advisory Committee. We look forward to hearing more about that. Prior to joining NEPC, Kristen spent six years at Mercer, where she was a principal in the Chicago office. Kristen holds an MBA in finance and accounting from the University of Chicago and a BS from Howard University. She is the chair of the Chicago State Foundation Investment Committee. Welcome to Kristen. And last but certainly never least, it's Leslie Anderson. Leslie is the global head of enterprise technology, employee experience, and U.S. Chief Technology Resiliency and Experience Operations Officer for BMO Financial Group. Leslie leads the strategic alignment and enablement of key technology tools for the bank's workforce to ensure a differentiated employee and customer experience that drives value, growth, and profitability enterprise-wide. Leslie has held leadership roles in various capacities dating back to her initial tenure with Harris Bank in 1996, where she led the bank's urban emerging market strategy. Leslie has a bachelor's degree in finance from Hampton University and an MBA with a focus on entrepreneurship, marketing and strategy from Northwestern's Kellogg School of Management. Leslie serves on the executive board of the Chicagoland Entrepreneurial Center in 1871 and the board chair of One Goal Chicago co-chair of the advisory board of After School Matters, advisory board member of the YWCA Impact Investment Group, and the Chicago State University Foundation Board of Directors. Wow, what a group we have today, and I am thrilled, thrilled, thrilled uh, to be talking um, with all of you. So let's just jump right in. I've gone through your bios, which are fantastic, and just set you head and shoulders above the rest. But I would like to know from each and every one of you, just to kind of kick off our conversation here, what motivated you to enter into the financial services industry? Personally, I kind of fell into it. Um, I've only been in the industry for about four, four and a half to five years. Um, but what led you to this industry? Let's start so, with you. So I'll jump Let's, in. Okay, please. I'll jump in. So I, I actually, I love the field of finance. Um, I actually went to college thinking I was going to be a lawyer. And my mentor, uh, who was a lawyer, said, do not major in pre-law, major in business. And I chose finance over accounting because finance allowed me to bring um, 
a strategic lens to this work. And when I graduated, um, I interviewed for, at the time it was NBD Bank, it's now Chase. Um, and the recruiter said, if you don't really know what you wanna do, go work for a bank because you can do every, you can actually engage in any industry you want. You can engage in legal, you can engage in HR, you can engage in sales, analysis, whatever it is. And then you can go deep within an industry. And so it was literally, it felt like I was at the door of the world when I walked through the doors of, of uh, MBD at the time. So that's why I, I started there because I thought it would give me the, the broadest lens of what I would eventually fall in love with. Did it live up to the promise, Leslie? It did, it did. Fabulous. Parika. Well, thank you. It's great to see everyone. Um, so for me, I was an econ major and I fell in love with the idea of Wall Street and wanted to be a part of it, although I didn't want to move to New York. So I was, <laughs> I was in Southern California, went to school in Southern California. And at the time, the three markets for financial services or really uh, sort of finance was New York, Chicago, in San Francisco. And so I chickened out a little bit, started in, in LA and then moved up to the Bay Area and ultimately did make it to Chicago where I spent 16 years up until just recently. So love the work, love the idea of it, thought I wanted to be a, um, a portfolio manager and uh, so started my career as an analyst. Outstanding, okay, thank you. How about you, Kristen? Sure. So um, again, uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a humbling experience to be on this panel with uh, such esteemed um, colleagues. Um, I joined uh, the industry of finance by accident. So I was actually a pre-med undergrad major, uh, really thought I was going to be a doctor, enjoyed the sciences, um, did a number of internships sort of in the lab. So I, I like to dissect stuff. I mean, that was like my thing. Um, and towards the end of my college career, I ended up having um, the opportunity to go into the hospital. And so that seemed like the very you know, uh, next step uh, before going to medical school, but there was just one issue. The issue was once I got into the hospital environment, I realized that I really don't like sick people. I, I still don't <laughs> like sick people. My husband is a physician, I don't like them. And so I was like, so that's a problem. I'm not really gonna be able to do that. And so I started to really just kind of try to figure that out um, at the end of my um, college career. I, so I'd had all my pre-med requirements and, you know, that was what we, I was at Howard University. So it was like Howard has a medical school. So um, all of that um, seemed uh, to be going forward. And then I had a, a screeching stop. So I started moving towards master's of public health, took a few classes, came home. And my parents were like, what are you going to do? Um, and I started working for a not-for-profit in marketing. And so I then um, had the idea of, you know what, maybe I just need to go to business school. <laughs> it's like, because I need to do something. And so that is exactly what I did. Um, and because at the nonprofit, I was doing marketing, I thought I was going to go into marketing. Um, one of my uh, esteemed panelists uh, shared that I should have gone to her uh, school, her alma mater, but I didn't. I went to University of Chicago, which is a very quantitative school. And so I found myself in all these marketing classes. Um, but really had a lot, you know, it's a very quantitative school. So everything was sort of pushing me into quantitative, you know, uh, you know, just analysis and the like. And so started taking a few classes in um, uh, investments and I liked it, corporate finance. And so next thing you know, I looked up and I was taking entrepreneurial finance and all these great, uh, amazing classes. And so that resulted in me moving away from marketing into finance um, and ended up um, working at a firm called Donaldson, Lufkin and Jenred in the private wealth management group because that married the investment component with the marketing component that I felt that I needed. Um, and, um, you know, the rest is history. I then ended up moving into consulting, uh, working with larger institutions instead of individuals. And so that's a, a little bit of a crooked path in, into the career that I am now, but I've been doing it for 20 years and I love it. So. As 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 a, as a fellow career lattice traverser, you know where you kind of go this way. Mm -hmm. uh, that's fan fantastic. I think it's a lot that uh, um, individuals can take away from it. That you know don't have to be set on one thing. You should really keep our minds open. So how about you, Nicole? 
Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, so I actually was a director of operations for a um, retail company, and then I wanted to go back to school, uh, not unlike some of the panelists, and get my MBA. And in one of the open houses I attended, uh, instead of it being a focus on corporate finance, it was more on uh, wealth management. And so I had a friend that was uh, an advisor at UBS. Uh, I sat down with him and he told me, um, you know, how does practice slow and steady wins the race. I took a huge pay cut, uh, went to UBS uh, as an assistant to a financial advisor, got licensed and then moved over to Morgan Stanley. So kind of a roundabout way, but um, landed in a great place. and I love what I do. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. All right, ladies, you ready? Let's jump in. <laughs> Let's jump in. So the banking and finance industry is certainly predominated by um, white males in particular. I think we heard some of those uh, statistics in, in um, Chair David's remarks. So what challenges or barriers have you encountered both in entering the field, however way you got there, and as you rose through different um, positions and into your current positions, how did you address and overcome some of those barriers that you encountered? So Leslie, you mind starting us off with that one? I, I don't mind at all. Um, so interestingly enough, um, I, when I, so I, I'm, I'm very cerebral, like if that from my dad, um, and actually my father was the first uh, analyst on Wall Street. He worked for Bayesian wow. Company, which is now Prudential. So I have a lineage of um, kind of breaking through some barriers. I decided that in order for me to learn how to navigate a white male dominated industry, I needed a white man to help me do that. And so my first mentor when I got to MBD Bank was uh, a white Irish from the south side of Chicago who happened to be um, differently minded. So it, he didn't see me clearly as competition. And he pulled me aside and said, so let me just tell you how this works. You are different. Leverage it. Lean into it. And I was I was coming up through the, the sales analyst uh, program. So we were selling to uh, mid-market companies. And he said, you know, a lot of your peers aren't going to go to the south side of Chicago. That's where a lot of our great businesses are, Leslie. You feel comfortable there. And so I had someone that was pushing me very early in my career from with a face that we probably would never have expected um, to be my authentic self. Uh, part of it, and, and he's still one of my mentors today. Um, he said he bets on jockeys all the time. Um, and that's how he's built his career as a leader. And that's that's how I, you know, I, I don't know that I've I've other than working incredibly hard, which we know we have to do. I was the first one there. I was the last one to leave. I read anything that I could get my hands on. Um, I, I, I pushed and I put myself in uncomfortable situations. I you know, raised my hand for goals that nobody else wanted. Um, and I, I'm extremely competitive and I let my natural competitive nature help to, to push me um, to success. I don't think that I broke all of them for sure. Um, Cause I'm still, as we sit here together there's still not many of us. And even as coming up I didn't have a lot of people that looked like me. Uh, but I was determined, one of the reasons why I stayed was they weren't gonna run me out. Like I was mm -hmm. determined to say, I don't care what, there is a place for me and I want people coming behind me to believe the same. Mm -hmm. You know, what's so great about your story, and, and thank you for sh for sharing that, um, is you got insights from what many would, many folks would have avoided someone like yeah. that. You know, they just would have said, I, I need to find the people who look like me, which is important and true. But what you described is you ran into someone who had cultural competence, who knew that you had a lot to offer and there's a way for you to excel that your peers just are not going to take advantage of. And and that that is was probably some of the most priceless advice uh, yeah. you probably could have got, especially, especially just starting out. Yeah. So and my success I, I wish didn't it was more impinge like on his. Yeah. I, he wasn't, he wasn't afraid of me being great at who I was. Wow. And that is rare. I, I absolutely know that. 
Yeah. So, it, so it, you know, if there's if there was a T-shirt, I would put what you just said on it. Find <laughs> people who are not afraid of you being great. Period. That's right. That's right. That's right. It's like you know, the pie is big enough for all. Okay. Anybody else have some thoughts they want to share about that? Yeah, my experience is very similar. I mean, so you know, looking for someone who looks like you. For me, I'm a little bit ahead of you all in my career and uh, in age. And um, and there there weren't there weren't any women who looked like me. There weren't any you know there weren't black people you know necessarily. Um, sometimes you're the one and only. And if it weren't for you know a white guy who similar to you who tapped me and decided that he was going to pour into me and he was going to challenge me and he was going to make me do re regression studies about things that he didn't even care about just to push to make sure that I could do it. Um, so, you know, I think for, for all of us, we've probably seen people who didn't automatically, and they weren't using the words allies back there, but you look for your allies, look for people mm -hmm. who care about moving the mission of the company forward and people with talent along with them. And so I think that that is most critical. Don't be afraid to reach out to folks to get to know people who don't look like you, who may not have similar backgrounds. You never know where someone, you know, where they may have a passion or a personal commitment. And so don't wait for someone that looks, that looks like you. Now, when you are in that seat and you are the person and you're the only, you know, you're the leader or whatever, do not hesitate to take the calls of those people who are coming up behind you. That's, that's, the, that's the price we owe for sitting in the seats that we sit in now. And so that, that's, you know, very similar situation. though. And that would be the back of the T-shirt. Pick yeah. up the phone when people call. You. That's right. That's very, right. Very, very good. That that's that's just awesome. Um, and and any tips from anyone on approaching those sources, those potential allies? Any any examples you can share? Yeah, you know, I um, and as Karika knows, I'm no stranger or not afraid to kind of reach out to people that don't look like me in the. Uh, firm that we work for. And I think it's really important for you to know who the leaders are in your markets, right? And you should be um, laser focused on finding out how they're winning, right? Who they have around them, like what their team looks like. And ask them if you can put some time on their calendar, right? I don't think there's anything wrong or most people are not going to um, balk at you saying, can I get 30 minutes on your calendar? Once a month, once a quarter. But if you're not surrounding yourself with the top players or the top performers, um, then you're doing yourself a disservice if they just, if it's only because they don't look like you. Yeah, my experience, you, you, you too many people have head down all the time and they don't right. come yeah. up. So if you, so if you if you're driving and you're only looking down, you're gonna hit some, and it could yeah, be exactly. fake, right? So <laughs> you know we got to look up and look around to see where we're going. Um, Nicole, let me stick with you for just a second because you mentioned in your in your um, your intro about being motivated for the industry. You mentioned taking a, a, a pay cut, and data shows that Black and female finance uh, professionals, in particular, suffer that wage gap. How have you advocated for yourself and others to ensure that your con uh, con contributions are valued at the same level as your counterparts, particularly your white counterparts? Yeah. And so that pay cut happened when I got into finance, right? So I was, uh, you know, at the entry level. Um, and then when I became financial advisor, you kind of get a base and bonus and then the base um, fades away, you know, over a period of time. And so I really, um, it, and so then when I, so as an advisor, you know, you pretty much, you know, you eat what you kill, right? But when I moved into management, um, that's where I think the, the, the pay the pay grade became a little bit more um, equalized. Now that's just kind of as far as the base goes. Everybody gets the same base for the most part, given your uh, respective roles. How how you really leverage your income is on that discretionary bonus. And I have to tell you, it is so important to have an idea or to know what those top performers are getting paid what they're doing. And so then if you can align your actions with what the firm values and what they're willing to pay a premium on, you then can ensure that you are able to
to articulate to yourself and the people that may be in rooms that you are not in, but that are making decisions about your compensation, you can help give them the narrative of why you deserve X, right? And I think as black women or women of color, um, people of color, you, you have to be, you know, it's, you know, sometimes it feels a little, um, contradictory to like, you know, wave your own flag, but you have to be your biggest advocate, right? You have to let people know what you're doing, how you're managing situations, how you're thinking through situations so that you can ensure that you're getting paid what you're worth. Know your value. That That's, that, that's awesome. And, and, and great advice, you know, and there is a way um, to have what you said, a narrative around what you want to do and, and and what that what that value should look like. So how can we make that happen? Is advocating for yourself, especially when there may not be anybody else who's able to do that. And sometimes we uh, are the only ones, the best ones, to uh, really position ourselves. Um, for Absolutely. Things. So so Kristen, how about you weigh in on that as well? Well, I mean, I think a couple of things as it relates to that narrative. I mean, making sure that you are, you know, understand what the playing field is, is imperative. You can only do that if you understand the culture of the organization that you're in, um, reaching out, um, doing things that may initially not be as comfortable because it does push you outside of your box. And so, but you I think to learn, you have to expand that box. Um, always be open to um, feedback, you know, being someone that um, it, there is, because nobody's perfect, but if there is a misstep, you will take that constructive feedback uh, with, you know, and, and think about it and be, you know, objective about it and not defensive about it. I think that that's something, especially as black women, we have to be very careful about because even the slightest sort of, you know, indentation will look as if you're being very defensive. And so I don't suggest that you don't be strong. I think we all have to be strong, but you have to kind of know the battles and know who you're dealing with and know sort of just that culture. Um, what I do love about what's happening right now is that the culture, I think of organizations, corporations, and all entities are starting to change. And so that allows for, I think, more personalities as it relates to the, what you bring with your cultural background, being able to come into play. But, you know, as I said, I've been doing this for about 20 years now. And so in that 20 years, there's been times where I've had to just take a step back and listen, you know, listen, understand where they're coming from, and then be able to articulate succinctly um, where you're coming from and, and do it in a manner that fits, um, you know, it, it may not be in the boardroom, it may be having lunch with someone, it may be, you know, really getting to know that person and having that person get to know you. I think, again, another sort of pearl of wisdom is oftentimes we're taught to kind of keep, you know, our personal life very separate from our business life. But many times the organizations we're with, if they don't know anything about your business life, or excuse me, your personal life, then they feel they don't know you. And if they don't know you, they can't trust you. Um, and I'll give a, a story that one of my mentors gave me. There was a couple, they were getting married uh, and their team members didn't know. They felt that they couldn't trust that person because they didn't know they were getting married. It had nothing to do with the business, their performance and what they were doing. And so you have, you can't underestimate that level of trust that needs to be a two-way street just to know who and what you are and how you're going to respond to things. And that doesn't mean you have to agree on everything, but it does mean that you do open yourself up a little bit. So that's what I would offer. So telling your story is important. It doesn't mean that you have to let everybody into your deep, dark, you know, secrets and past, but just enough so they can know I'm human, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm human and I got good stock. Thank you very much. You yeah. know, um, you know, Melissa, can you know, jump in? Melissa can absolutely. I jump in? please, Leslie, please. Um, as we think about this way, because I, I don't think as much as I think many of us on the panel have chipped away at this whole wage conversation. Um, the reality is it's still not where it should be. Uh, one of the things that my mentor, one of my mentors has always said is invest in yourself in ways that is not um, completely tied to your organization. So that 
you know, so that you get feeds from other organizations saying, oh, my God, Leslie, I would love for you to come over here. And this is what we are willing to, you know, always be open yeah. to those conversations. And I'm not talking yeah. about, you know, interviewing all over the world. But when you when you build your resume in, in public spaces where people begin to value the outcomes and the impacts that you've had, it, it gives you another lever to have that wage conversation in ways that people just in one organization and are there for 25 years. And not to say that that's bad, but it, it gives you a different vantage point from which to have that, that negotiation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and how much freedom is that, right? That you, that you can say, this is not the last place on earth. This is right. not the last opportunity on earth, mm -hmm. right? I can, I can say no. <laughs> That's right. That's I, I can right. say thanks, you know, without feeling like, oh my gosh, if I'm not at this with this brand, with this title, then I'm, you know, I have an empty and meaningless life. Right. So what you what you all are, are speaking to is about how do you empower yourself to ensure that you can make some choices and stay in that driver's seat every now and again, let a passenger in, especially yep. they're gonna help you navigate, right? Mm -hmm. They're gonna be a co-pilot, but you stay in that driver's seat and figure out which direction you need to go. Um, was there anything else somebody wanted to add? Yeah, well, I just wanted to touch upon that point where um, Leslie was sharing about both internal and external of your organization. Oftentimes, as you rise in the organization, some of the criteria for promotion and within your organization is being um, known industry-wide, which would be external. So I think it serves both for no, you know continuing to build your own worth, but also the out the internal organization needs to understand from the external industry where you fall and they also put that into those performance numbers when they start to think about uh, promotion so i think again it just goes to the point that you got to be dual you got to kind of build both pipelines yeah and i was going to say that you know nicole started by you know identifying the right people and making those appointments getting on those calendars and you know i think you know as we rounded out this conversation it is owning your narrative. It is knowing your worth and it's being willing to speak up, right? But it's not just who you know and it's who you know who knows you as the, you know, we just talked about. It's it's important to know people and have that great Rolodex, but it's more most important that they know you, what you have to offer, and you know, what you can bring to any organization, not just the one that you sit in. I think Janet Jackson said, what have you done for me lately? Yeah. Like, they, you know, these people want to make those connections because yeah. their brand is going to be tied to you in, right. in some kind of way. So it's so it's 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 definitely a fair point. And I think it's also uh, important to to recognize is that people like us, the five of us on this screen and many others who are watching mm -hmm. us as well. We're not well known inside some of these organizations and in some of these industries. The fewer populations there are like us in finance and in banking and technology and some of these other industries, it, it's almost like being behind the glass of a menagerie, you know, like I can't see you, I, you know, I'm just observing and, you know, just trying to figure you out, you know, and, and looking at you from afar. So, so, you know, we have to become more savvy at figuring out what does it take to navigate this organization, the written rules, the unwritten rules, the spoken rules, the unspoken rules. And who can I find that would be a trusted advisor that would help give me some of those insights that I'm just not going to see posted on the, the intranet site? Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. And I, I think you just yes. brought up on another point, you know, who can you find from a mentor standpoint, as well as who can you find from an advocate? And knowing that those two things are different. A mentor helps you along, they'll give you advice. An advocate uses their influence to move you forward. And mm -hmm. so you really need to have multiple of both, both internal and external of your um, organization. Absolutely. So do you think as an industry, the financial services and banking industry is doing enough? Are they putting enough intention on diversity, equity, and inclusion in very meaningful kinds of ways? We know that 2020 just, you know, some, you know, it's on everybody's tongue. It doesn't mean that everybody's doing something about it effectively. So what should still be addressed and, and what is the pivot we should be looking for? I think we're doing more. So I, I don't want to discount 
what I've seen over the last year or so. Mm -hmm. um, but should we be doing more? Absolutely. I mean, we are at, at BMO, we are pushing now for accountability where it hits people in their pockets. You, you want to you wanna say that diversity is important? So that's one of your measuring points, senior vice president. Um, and we've been pushing for that for a long time. And, and really, that, that's an outgrowth of us saying we're, we're done just doing something. Mm -hmm. we, we came out with this big $5 billion um, investment uh, to, to bridge this racial gap um, on equity and, and inclusion and uh, financial stability. But the reality is, it, it, if you allow it to, it's just doing something. What we've now challenged the organization is, we're going to now be impact driven. The scorecard is going to change. It is not checking a box anymore. We are going to say, we're going to do this. We're going to see if it has an impact. If it doesn't, we're going to pivot. And we're going to keep pivoting until we start to really make meaningful chips away at this. Because mm -hmm. and, it, and it's taking, right, wrong, or indifferent, the few leaders that look like us mm -hmm. um, to, to talk with our feet. Like we're saying, this is if you all aren't really behind this, then we're not really behind you and really mm. taking a stand. And, and that's how organizations, you know, that's how that's how organizations listen from a customer perspective. Customers mm. talk with their feet. And mm -hmm. it's about time that we do the same. And I'm not saying I'm not advocating for people to have a mass exit from the financial industry. Um, but what I am saying is that you have value. It's now time to start cashing in on that. Mm -hmm. And there is no better time than now to push the envelope for the kinds of impacts that really are gonna to start to move the dial forward in ways that we don't keep taking one step forward, two step back. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, looking for that sustainability. Um, and the window, I believe uh, what you're saying, um, Leslie, the window is cracked open right now. It, it, is. Is, it is the topic du jour right now. And I think we have to be responsible with this opportunity as well. We've gotta be prepared, we've gotta be courageous, we've gotta be bold, we gotta be ready. We got to yep. stay ready, more so than I think um, we were um, in the past. So let me switch gears a little bit because I want to make sure that we uh, address equity from the standpoint of personal responsibility in terms of wealth building. Um, because we know that the industry as an employer, you know, the industry has some things that it needs to work on. But what are some thoughts around what individuals should be doing to address? the racial wealth gap at the institutional level, at the personal level, what are some of the, what's some of the advice, Kristen, that you may be sharing with some of your clients? Well, I think the first component is really education. And I think culturally we have not, uh, we've gotten education, but not financial education, financial literacy. And I mean, from the basics, learning, you know, you know, when do you start saving, you know, opening a bank account, saving, you know, what do you save? You know, you have your emergency fund, you have your spending money, you know, having those different buckets, really living within your means, and then also thinking about how you build up credit. You know, what does that entail? Um, and I, I, again, I come back to just education. We can learn at all and every level. I mean, and, and, and for the youngest learners, little things like learning how to read the New York Times, looking, learning how to read the Wall Street Journal, that's what our peers are doing yeah. in our non-people of color. Their kids are reading those types of, um, you know, they may be reading other books, but they're reading that initially as well. And so just learning about it, learning about what a stock is, learning about um, how do you invest, learning about what does it mean to be an entrepreneur, you know, all of those things. I mean, those are all pretty broad topics that I've brought up, but those are topics that uh, many adults people of color don't know if they're not in investments. And so that I think is really at the core of it because once you understand that you need to start saving early, that you know the little things of not paying a small you know, phone bill or, or something as small as that, like it may be $50 can ruin your, could make the difference mm -hmm. between you being able to buy a car, being able to buy a house later on or what have you. Those are the things that I don't think have been really um, across the board, I should say. 
um, mm -hmm. under widely understood. And so I just think that there's it's almost a whole overhaul, education overhaul of what is acceptable mm -hmm. and what are the best practices that we should all be doing. And it's not about how much money you have. You can learn to save if, if it's $20 a week, that is saving. Those habits are what will propel you forward as you have larger dollars to be able to save larger dollars. You are in the habit of it. So it is forming those sort of good habits early on. Mm -hmm. Teaching mm -hmm. your children, okay, you know, you want to buy X, you need to participate in buying X by saving your money and then giving them the opportunity to earn money whether it be chores, you know, whatever the case may be. But there's all kinds of ways to do it on a very young level, all the way up to having training at a, at a, at a higher level. And so um, that's something that, you know, I work mostly with institutions, but part of my business, a significant part of my business is public funds. And the trustees in those um, institutions are not um, that are making the decision oftentimes are not trained in investments and so it is my job to not just tell them what to do but to bring them up the curve if you will so that they understand what they're investing in why they're investing in just the basics I call it investments 100 investments 101 really to kind of prepare you to make the appropriate decisions and so again there's a lot of ways to attack it I just said a mouthful in these <laughs> two minutes but I do think the core of that is of education yeah. absolutely and you can you can start small i mean like i said I, I've, I just entered into the industry four and a half years ago and it is such a wealth of information that is available that it's incredible i think we have to get beyond the fear and the intimidation that goes along with oh my god finances oh my god you know banking like it's complex it is but find somebody again gets back to those trusted advisors find somebody who can walk you through some things so um how about nicole parika you you're yeah. in that business anything yeah, yeah so one please. of the things yeah oh sorry yeah so one of the things just you know kind of tagging on to what Kristen talked about financial literacy is key and, you know, we obviously were in the wealth management business, but we have a commitment to closing the racial wealth gap. And I actually sit on a committee um, for the firm with the upcoming, uh, the Black Wealth Summit It's the first of its kind. Many, Morgan Stanley is a lead and founding sponsor, but so are some of our competitors. And B of A is there and JP Morgan, everyone will be there in October and it's virtual. So anyone can, can, participate. And one of the things that Kristen mentioned is that you can start small, but you can start at any time. So mm -hmm. at any time you can, you know, build your financial literacy, ultimately, you know, gain, you know, the, the acumen necessary to manage investments and to become cult uh, financially fluent. And mm -hmm. that's really what this is about. And so you'll see, uh, you know, it's the, the site's already up on social media, Blackwell Summit, uh, I think it's the Black Wealth Summit. It's on Instagram, Facebook, and all of that. But that's really what it's focused on. And I think um, sometimes you don't know. You you can't find that trusted advisor. You just don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. And so starting somewhere, starting with, as you and I both know, having done some work with the Federal Reserve Bank, there are so many institutions that offer mm -hmm. you know financial literacy in some way. And I think that's mm -hmm. really what's critical. And I think all of our you know organizations in some way or another, we're pouring into the communities that we serve. And we mm -hmm. do that either in, you know, through sponsorship or in very tangible ways like these uh, literacy programs. But I think that's gonna be the, the savior for all of us. We know that, you know, 2009, when many people were losing their homes, black people lost their homes mm -hmm. more than me. And 25% of the black population lost significant wealth well, because mm -hmm. of that. And part of it, it was, you know, obviously lack, lack of diversification, but also lack of education. And so that's what we're, you know, we're really striving for. If we're going to close mm -hmm. that wealth gap, we have to do it through financial literacy. Yeah. At Wintrust, we, we, we definitely promote that financial literacy, financial empowerment and financial mobility. Like there's things that are available to individuals if they know where to look. So how yeah. do we lead them to that space of knowing where to look? What would you add to that, uh, Nicole? How does one get to be one of those high net worth individuals you're talking to? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I think if you look at the numbers and you think about the mass of 
affluent and then the ultra high net worth, um, a lot of people accumulate wealth in their retirement accounts. So if you get, you know, you get your first job, your second, your second career, third career, you know, I think that it is imperative that you find out how much you can contribute to the to your 401k, what the company's match is, because if you're leaving money on the table if you're not doing so. And so and that's a way to really, as Kristen mentioned, like, how do you form a habit? How do you create repeatable behaviors? If you're putting money every way into your uh, 401k or 403b, you know, then you start to think about, okay, well, maybe I can go to a bank and open up another account, right? Or I can go to another mm -hmm. firm and start an investment account on my own. You know, it, that is, in my opinion, like hands down, the most important thing you can do is contribute to your 401k, try to max it out, get the company match and start that as your baseline. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that we have, we do have different generations. I'm not going to tell you which ones, but we do have different <laughs> generations <laughs> on this call. And I, I, I love the fact that there really is something for everyone on this call, no matter where you are on your financial journey, you can start anywhere. So even if you feel like, gosh, I'm, I'm only I don't know, five, 10 years away from retirement, you still can start somewhere and build that nest egg and have something prepared to pass along. We're going to shift now and start looking at some audience questions. And one has come in that says uh, finance seems least diverse at the highest levels of leadership. What advice do you have for a young black professional with C-suite aspirations? And I have to say, um, uh, and Parika, you and I know this well it, through all the studies and research through the financial services pipeline, which is a consortium of area banks and financial services institutions in the Chicago area looking to narrow the representation gap of particularly blacks and Latin Latinx in the industry, in the local industry. And one of the things our research has found, and you can look at fspchicago.org and look at four different iterations of research that continues to reinforce the fact that there does not seem to be much mo upward mobility beyond the manager level. So what advice would you have for these young professionals looking to move into the industry? And, and frankly, we need them in the industry. We need that degree of cultural competence in the industry. So what advice would you would you have for helping someone get started and then get on that trajectory and, and finding those those mentors? You know, I, I, I'll jump in. Um, you know, what, what the first thing I would say is get in the game. The, the landscape is changing. And it and and I'm hoping that um, we will continue to have more and more in the C-suite, but it might be that person. It might be this young woman at Chicago State that that you know opens that first door at whatever financial institution. Um, that was my motivation. Is that th there's not a lot of us here, and if we continue to shy away from it, and we are we are phenomenal. Um, workers, we are phenomenal leaders. We have a lot to offer. Don't sell yourself short and get in the game. And I, you know, I work hard and 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 keep your options open. Because I I've been at three financial institutions. I started off at what is now Chase. I went to BMO. I went to Fifth Third. I came back. Um, you know, I I, I also don't let the financial services industry define what success looks like for me. So that's the other thing. But I, 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 anyone that is interested in the financial services and has aspirations for the C-suite, do not get dismayed or deterred by the fact that they're not a lot there. That might be mm -hmm. your calling to be there just for be that the reason. First. Be the first, be the right? First. Be, be the, the change you want to see yep. and not the last, right? And not Pick the last. Home. That's that's right. That's right. I was hoping Leslie would answer first because I knew you were going to go there. I you know never met her before today, but I knew she was going to go there because the truth of the matter is, you know, don't first of all don't allow yourself to be defined by what you don't see. That's Ken right. Chenault never he he didn't see anyone before he became the head of American Express. So don't allow. I, I'm not a big fan of you got to yeah. see it to be it because there are a lot of people who didn't see it and they became it. So that's first and foremost. So, you know, build your network, 
create, you know, learning opportunities, both within your organization and outside of your organization, you know, try um, to get yourself into some stretch opportunities. You know, that's, uh, there's nothing wrong for asking for more, you know, nothing wrong with asking for more, but there's also nothing wrong with showing up in your community and serving on nonprofit boards where there are other corporate leaders who will mm -hmm. see you. Um, mm -hmm. You know, your C-suite aspirations shouldn't be defined because you're young, you're a young black first professional. Your C-suite aspirations should be what you want, how are you going to get there, what education do you need, what experiences do you need, and then, you know, commit to all of the self-study and all the self-improvement and mentors, advocates, and champions. You need all of those things. Mm -hmm. And what contribution do you want to make? You know, er, you know, lots of people are educated, but they don't necessarily contribute anything, right? So what contribution, what difference, what, how can you be the difference maker uh, for, you know, internally or externally? That's, that's how they get to know of you, as you mentioned earlier, Parika. Here's another question. What type of R&D, I assume that means research and development, would you like to see financial institutions do to create better products or services that serve the black community? Kristen looks like she wants to answer, so yeah. I, I, I just heard no. <laughs> well, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> I have an answer. I'll, I'll, I'll follow you. <laughs> so we, we only got five minutes. Yeah, Where do you go? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Or were you going to take? Thank it, you, Kristen? Nicole. Go ahead. Go ahead, Nicole. Yeah, please, okay. Nicole. Yeah, I, I was going to say, you know. Um, it's important to be in the communities in which you want to serve, right? And so if most of the wealth management firms or investment firms or banks are in more affluent neighborhoods, um, that's what they know, that's what they serve, and that's going to be the target market. I think it would be um, really beneficial for firms to spend some time and really understand what that Black Latinx consumer looks like, right, as they're trying to really move into uh, earning, you know, earning more of an income, accumulating wealth. And so if we were able to really kind of invest in our, you know, in our neighborhoods or in our communities um, and being boots on the ground, I think that would be invaluable. Mm -hmm. So home ownership is one of those, right? Yeah. And get, get, getting more people encouraged in the black community to be homeowners and to position yourself as such. And and you know, as 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 a community bank, Wintrust, for example, offers a lot of those opportunities to take those baby steps to put yourself in a position to become more, you know, credit prepared, et cetera. So you got you just start somewhere. I think is what the resounding um, message and advice yeah. is that everyone. So from an R and D standpoint, would you say that the 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 products and services are probably already out there? It's just a matter of figuring out which they're, they're all the same. And, Okay. Yeah. They are all the same. Yeah. And, and you really, it, people need to also, it, it's about, it, Kristen said it earlier, it's about education. Yeah. Teaching people to, because to, every bank is not for everybody. Right. So if you are a business and you are a contractor and you want to grow your business, then you need to know to look for a bank that invests in contractors, that has a contracting business. You want to, you want to, you, we, we talk about money and money is, um, is just one part of the conversation. It's about smart money and, and smartly going after that money in ways that aligns with how you want to, how you can, how you will, and how you're able to grow your business. Right. The products are, are all the same. It really is right. how we, how we think about the, the adjudication behind it has to shift some. Yeah, absolutely. Especially yeah. after this pandemic, but, but really it's about educating us Mm -hmm. and empowering us to make the right decisions about our finances and who to align with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, I wanted to just add here, and it, it was the reason I kind of hiccup is because I was like, I don't remember the name of this firm, but there's a woman by the name of Valerie Mosley, and she just actually started a company that deals with the credit worthiness that, um, people of color have. And so oftentimes we're deemed as uncredit worthy because they, we have that tick on our credit history. But there's a lot of um, 
data that actually suggests those individuals are actually far more credit worthy than some of the other more traditional means. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I've been racking my brain. Um, she started at Valmo. She used to work for Wellington. So this is a prime example of a woman in our business that did extraordinarily well um, and retired from Wellington, uh, you know, as a partner, and then is now giving back to her community and actually started another um, company. It's just launched, which is why I can't believe um, I shouldn't even be doing this on video. <laughs> so you would be like, shoot me. But um, she just literally started this company very recently, and it's connecting assets to those that are not deemed by the traditional standards as credit worthy in the brown uh, or people of color, so brown and black communities, but they actually are very credit worthy. It's just that little, uh, you know, from our backgrounds culturally of having that little, little tick on our, on our credit report that all of a sudden says, you, you are a, a good um, investable, uh, someone that we yep. should be investing with. Mm -hmm. And so back to that question of there are, there is, research being done and there are products that are coming out and I think that we should be the leaders of those products because we know our communities mm -hmm. and then we transcend and then you work with the larger companies like Morgan Stanley if you will to kind of push it along um, so just mm -hmm. wanted to add that that it is happening and Valerie Mosley is her name so anybody can look her up and, and find out <laughs> what what she's actually doing um, to, to, to bring people to capital and capital yeah. people go find out how credit worthy you are i've seen i've heard statistics through the mortgage bankers association that people of color tend to be more credit worthy than they even know they don't even know what it means you know so really let that be your first degree of education is yeah. is what what does credit mean and what does credit worthiness looks like and what is my credit score and how do i protect it okay right. So right. we're, we're a couple minutes away from um, the, wrapping up the program in the top of the hour. This has just been a fantastic program. I think the only thing that's missing is a glass of wine for each of us. So, <laughs> you know, the next time we're together, first round's on me. Mm -hmm. um, so give me, I just want to go around the horn. Give me one word, one word that would describe something you wish you knew more about when you first decided to enter into the financial services industry as this energetic black female what's one word that describes one thing you wish you would have no, uh, known more about exposure um, I've been... okay exposure yeah, go say, ahead uh, nicole relationship currency okay all right leslie sponsorship Okay. And Kristen. So mine was close to advocacy. Advocacy. It is really interesting that no one of you, not one of you mentioned some financial technical term. Nobody said, I need to understand the market. Nobody, nobody said that. It, you all mm -hmm. talked about some ways of helping you get the resources and the support you need to navigate the environment. And for that, I thank you for your insights, your wisdom, I appreciate you for your success. I appreciate all of the insights that you shared today. And I think our, 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 our audience is enriched because of it. Um, I do wanna mention that if there are any students out there who are interested in the banking and financial services industry, college students, I do invite you to participate in the upcoming Financial Services Pipeline Summer Intern Conference. It's taking place on July 6th and July 7th. For more information, do contact FSP at fspchicago.org. So email them for more information if you are interested in attending that free conference. And Parika is nodding because she knows how amazing it is to see 200 young, energetic students of color, mostly Hispanic and African-Americans just ready to take on the world. It is one of the most energizing things you ever want to see. So do check that out. So Melissa, thank can you I again. just give one shameless plug for Chicago State? For those students of that course. are at Chicago State, um, I just want to reinforce that they are in an amazing institution that has connections beyond the reach of any South Side individual. Um, and that they have they have a, a an advocate in President Scott and the leadership at, at Chicago State University. And they are actually in the right place to begin to, to invest in themselves in ways that allow them to hit that C-suite in the financial services industry, right at CSU. 
So I, I applaud all the students that are, are investing in themselves in that way. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Leslie Anderson, Parika Sampson, Nicole Sams, and Kristen Finney Cook. Thank you so much. I think at this point it is a wrap. Thank you, audience. Thank you, thank you. Chair David. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Be well.